Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Semi-Related Podcast. Today I'm here with Tony, a fleet maintenance and management professional and veteran. Tony, how are you doing today? Good, Jacob. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. So yeah, I just wanted to bring you on and discuss a little bit about your experience. So if you want to go ahead and start with your background in fleet management, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, I've probably been in fleet management about 15, 16 years, working with several different companies from uh, one of a beverage company that sells little red cans here in Atlanta, to a uh, food distributor, to also a heavy haul trucking company as well. Um, so I've managed all kinds of assets, all pieces of equipment from life to death of the asset. And how many years of experience do you have in fleet management? Uh, just about 16. Started in about 2008, kind of really got into it. Yeah, and then whenever we first connected, we talked a little bit about this, but we always think it's so interesting to hear those stories of how people found themselves in logistics, transportation, supply chain. So tell us a little bit about how you found yourself in this industry. This, um, I kind of fell into it, like, like we discussed. I mean, just about everybody falls into it in some way, shape, or form. Um, I was actually working for the beverage company, working on the procurement side and also on the e-procurement side, doing catalog maintenance and working with the procurement folks of what they buy. Um, so the nuts, bolts, screws, laptops, trinkets and trash, stuff like that. And I kept saying that I was a gearhead uh, at home. I liked working on vehicles, I liked working on cars and would really like to get into the fleet or the maintenance repair operation side of things. And it came to a point where they said, OK, well, we've got some openings in fleet. If you're ready, let's go. So I started uh, I started doing fleet procurement. So I was buying all the trucks, trailers, tires, belts, hoses, oil, you name it, everything that go within the trucks and the trailers and started doing that. And then there was a new VP that came on board and asked me to be his asset manager for North America. And up to that point, the company never had an, a national asset manager who looked at all the equipment across the board. And that's kind of how I stumbled into it. I just became the asset manager for North America. And that required, that was 54,000 pieces of equipment um, across the country. Yeah. And then kind of do a deep dive on what being an asset manager was like. Tell us a little bit about your experience and kind of learning that role from, like you mentioned, zero. Yeah. It's the the funny part is an asset manager is nothing more than maintaining the equipment. Um, Every person who owns a vehicle or owns, uh, basically owns a vehicle, a bicycle, whatever you hunt, you, you, you're an asset manager. Um, you know, you're taking care of the oil changes. You're making sure that you wash it. You're making sure that it stays up to date Then put new tires on when you need to put two, new tires on it. I was presented to, it was presented to me in that way. And then you just realize that you're just doing it on a much larger scale. You know, instead of dealing with just one car, you're dealing with thousands of pieces of equipment or heavy duty trucks or trailers and things like that. At the end of the day, it's all very similar components. It's a motor, tires, axles, it's all very, very similar components. So learning it from the ground up was just learning that equipment, learning that heavy haul equipment and how it works and how it operates. And fortunately, there's a lot of folks in this industry that like to help each other. Um, so there was, I had some mentors, not only within my own company, but so outside the company as well, from the truck, truck side, trailer side that said, hey, I'll show you this equipment and help you out, get through it. And um, I owe them a fair amount of my career, to be honest with you. So tell us a little bit about that. I know you kind of gave that example of we're all fleet managers, right? We have to make sure we have the oils changed, the tires checked, and, you know, the belts tightened. But how do you take that knowledge and work on that at scale, right? Um, I can't remember how many assets you said you were managing at one time, but just kind of dive into what it took to manage that at scale. Yeah. So at one point in time, I managed 54,000 pieces of equipment. Um, I had a team of seven. There were seven folks that worked for me directly. They were asset analysts. So they were the ones that that were closer to the regions. They were within the, we were, they were within that region, working very closely with the fleet managers, the technicians, the fleet supervisors that basically kept those assets alive. What I used to say was I was kind of the, I'm the obstetrician, the mortician. So I bring it into the system, take it out of the system. And then I worked very closely with the general practitioners, which were the ones that kept it alive every day for the life cycle of the piece of equipment. Um, but yeah, it was a team of seven. So if you actually think about it, that's a lot of piece of equipment per person. Um, but what we did is we looked to make sure we maximized the life of that asset. So if there was uh, trucks that were in a particular area that were only running maybe 50 miles a day or 60 miles a day, but then we had trucks in other areas that were 100, running 150, 100, 200 miles an hour, 200 miles a day, 
we rotate those around so we can kind of life, stretch the life cycle of the asset as opposed to just keeping it in that one place for 10 years running 50 miles a day. So it, it, that's, that's kind of what you start doing is you start looking at that type of stuff. And then also looking at if you're starting to have maintenance problems, um, if you start having the same maintenance problem within the same area, within the same type, you're making model vehicle, you can kind of start seeing that at a global scale as opposed to if it was done very locally. Yeah. And then what kind of systems would you have in place to help you manage all of these fleets working with all of these different team members and to even be able to recognize something like an issue with a similar make and model? A lot of that, the, the, the system that we used at the particular company was called Maximo, which was a old IBM program. It's still around today. They've refined it a little bit, but it's just a, basically a big database that holds a lot of information. And you can create custom reports that tells you different things. But what really kind of came down to it, like this one instance that I was telling you about, it was communication. It was just having those those folks with their feet on the ground and having a regular cadence of getting with them saying, hey, what are you seeing? What's going on? What's what's um, happening in the business units? And that's how we kind of came to that discovery. So a lot of it really just kind of came down to communication. You can have all the systems in the world, but if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know what you're looking for in the reports and you don't have the right people that understand what they're looking at, it won't do you any good. Oops, sorry, I lost you for a second. But so, yeah, then tell me a little bit about how you kind of manage that communication between these teams and what were some of the tips and tricks that you think were helpful for you and your team? I think the biggest thing was having that, having those relationships. Um, there were areas where the, the asset analyst didn't quite get along with the fleet manager, but we had to push past that, right? So at the end of the day, we still had to get product out to the shelves because that's what paid our paychecks. Um, but it had to have that relationship. So the, the key part was truly communication with the fleet managers and that sometimes my asset analyst might not get the right message across to to those team members, but I would go ahead and maybe step in and work with them and get that done because the key is communication. You can't do anything in a silo. The working in the silos doesn't work. You've got to be able to work cross-functionally as a team. And then what also helped too is that we had, not only my team was communicating to the fleet manager, but the other fleet managers were communicating each other, with each other as well. And I was a peer to them. So we would get together and discuss things that were going on as well. Um, you know, you talk about hierarchy within large corporations, but sometimes that's pretty good. It works to your advantage because you have that hierarchy where you can all come together and have those types of discussions. Yeah. And then you talk about this cross department collaboration, kind of talk about how fleet management rolls into these different departments. Like the example we talked about before was working with safety, for example, Kind of talk about how you worked with those team members and what that experience was like. Sure. So with fleet, you always touch several different departments. And like you mentioned, one of them being safety, another one being legal, another one being finance. I mean, you, you kind of touch all of them because of the different reasons. Safety, obviously, they're running the DOT. Typically, they're the ownership of the DOT and the drivers. So they have to keep that information up to date. They're always asking what kind of equipment are we operating? What's the data points that they need from that? Then you got legal that if anything is to happen, um, if there's an accident and God forbid someone gets killed or you have an accident of that level, you've got to be able to pull up those maintenance records to show that the equipment was being maintained properly, that there wasn't any faults or anything that we were aware of that could cause those issues. Finance, obviously, always work with finance because we're buying equipment. When you're spending millions of dollars on equipment, you're always working with the finance team to make sure that they book it correctly, depreciation, put it in the right place, things of that nature. I mean, those are three major groups that you work with just being with fleet. Some people think that fleet just kind of operates on its own and does their own thing, but you got to work with these other departments to uh, be successful. Um, you know, my biggest partner was always, my, my two biggest partners was safety and fleet, or I was safety and finance. Um, when I started even new companies, those are the first two folks I go to to make sure that I have a quick relationship with because they're the ones that can make either make or break the fleet. Yeah. And then let's talk a little bit too about you kind of started in this procurement role. So how was some previous experience like that useful to work with those different teams as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the procurement side was great because I, I was kind of fortunate because I got to reap the benefits of my own contracts um, after it rolled, when it rolled off. So that was, that was kind of a good thing, but you know, getting the procurement side allowed me to get to know the vendors and the players in the space a lot better than if I was just that fleet manager, or the asset manager, because that, that sits in a whole like kind of a different level where you get really detailed with the providers of the equipment 
um, a lot closer. And actually, that was a challenge for me to step out of from from procurement to the asset manager because I still wanted to have that relationship with those providers, with the Kenworths, with the Freightliners, with the Internationals, with the Max. I mean, I wanted to have that relationship still with them. But of course, when procurement does their thing where they throw out an RFP, it's like, you know, silence. Don't say anything to them. Don't talk to them. We got to work through that process. And that was a challenge. I mean, that, that is a very that is a very challenging part when coming through those two different types of roles. But the procurement part allowed me to learn. That's what helped me learn all this equipment and all that before going into the asset role and trying to manage the equipment across the company. And then you mentioned all of these different manufacturers, you know, the Freightliner, International, Mac. Which of these, I'm going to put a, a hard question out here. They can't all be softballs. Which of these do you think was your favorite? Which, uh, which uh, uh, manufacturer? you think you kind of lean towards you can get me in trouble on that one um, <laughs> depending on who sees this i will say that it depends and and i'm going to give you kind of a you're going to throw me a hard question i'm gonna throw you kind of a soft answer back it depends based on the cycle duty of what we're trying to do um, because i have worked for delivery companies you know that run a lot of inner city short routes with diesel trucks which is not the best thing for them mm -hmm. um and then you have the flip side where i was running a lot of long haul um, over the road type stuff. I will say that the over road, over the road type drivers love Peterbilts. There's something about the Peterbilt mystique, the big hood. It looks like a, you know, it looks like a real truck is what I was told a hundred times over. You know, it's the real truckers truck type thing. But like one thing that we did, uh, the one company I worked at, I mean, we basically spec the truck from every aspect. So the only thing that was different was the hood. You know, a couple maybe creature comforts inside, but the main everything else was spec the exact same. The engine, the transmission, the axles, the brakes, the slack adjusters, the belts. I mean, it was all spec. Um, so to say that I have a favorite, I'll, I'll throw it out there. My favorite's Freightliner, and the reason yeah. being is because it's it's a it's a multi-purpose truck. It's 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 meant to be a workhorse, and then it's meant to be put to retired. Um. You know, the Peterbilts have got their place. The Peterbilts and Kenworths have their place of being kind of more of the showy, nicer trucks. So I kind of compare Freightliner as your, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble if anybody ever sees this. <laughs> Freight, Freightliner is your kind of your Toyota Corolla or your economy vehicle where, you know, your, your Peterbilts and your Macs are more of your Lexus, Infinities, you know, your really, really nice rigs. And then how much would you let your drivers kind of play and roll in picking these? Like you mentioned, they had a preference for Peterbilt, for example. Uh, what what was the working relationship like there whenever picking the next truck? Depending on which company you talk about, but for the most part, what I tried to do is build a fleet council that would bring in drivers to say, what do you like about what you're driving? What do you don't like? What would you rather be driving? What are, what, you know, what's missing? What are, we, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? It's kind of a constant, constant uh, continuous improvement mentality where you do get the drivers engaged. And it, it's really funny, even at a company with thousands of drivers versus a company with just a few hundred drivers, it the principle works the same. Once you get a few drivers that say, hey, they're really listening to me. They're paying attention to us. They, they want to hear what we want to say. We, you know, they want to hear from us. It builds credibility very fast. And mm -hmm. I did. It's, I wasn't doing that just to do it. I was doing that because they're the ones that are behind the wheel every day. If they don't, if they have bad vision off the corner of the hood, then maybe we shouldn't be buying these big hood trucks. Maybe they should be the shorter, more aerodynamic. If they're having, you know, if they're having pulling problems where they can't pull the loads hard enough, maybe we're, gear, you know, maybe we're doing the wrong gearing in the trucks, and maybe we need to look at that a little bit better. But those guys, those guys and gals are sitting in those seats every day. They, they, they're the ones who are going to be able to tell me that information. There's no spreadsheet. There's no nothing that'll ever tell me that same information that those those folks will. And then, too, we talked about how this industry is so relationship driven. You know, we're all competitors, but at the end of the day, we're also friends working together within this industry. So when would you kind of look externally for some counsel and for some opinions on what others were seeing out there whenever looking for different solutions as well? I constantly looked for other solutions and tried to make make friends with, I mean, it's not that I tried to make friends. I just didn't make friends with other companies that were like, like our company or even competitors to our company. As you mentioned, at the end of the day, we're all trying to make things better, bigger, faster. So I would try, I would encourage to go speaking to them. And, and I always went out 
to work with them because everybody had everybody worked in these little silos. And again, I mentioned earlier, the silos don't work. You know, we got to get out of those silos and work out of that. There's no reason why I'll throw names out there. And if you want to bleep it, that's fine. But, you know, when I worked for Coca-Cola, working with UPS, we had a lot of synergies that Coca-Cola did some things really good. UPS did some things really good, but then Coca-Cola did some things bad and UPS did things bad. And we transferred that information back and forth and we were able to just improve. And sometimes those improvements could mean better gas mileage, better fuel mileage, which then you can promote, so, you know, helps the environment. I mean, you can go all different ways with, with that information. But when you when you keep pushing and keep trying to make it better, it, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. It, it should be an open book. And that's one thing that I think the trucking industry has done really good with ATA and TMC and those organizations where it allows folks to get together and have those conversations. And then what would you say to someone who's, you know, maybe newer to the position like you were whenever you started, how would you recommend they go out and get involved, get to know these people and make these friends so they can have that same knowledge transfer that you were having with these other great companies to learn from? The, the easiest part is one, get involved in these organizations. Like you just mentioned, go to these conferences and be part of it, but then be humble enough to walk up and say, Hey, I'm new to this. I need some help. Well, you know, go to the guys with the silver hair, <laughs> you know, go to the guys that are a little bit more uh, aged and say, Hey, what do you know? How do you do this? You know, almost the same question you just asked me here um, during this is, you know, go out there and ask those questions and be humble enough to ask those questions because honestly, we were all in the same, same boat. You know, most of the folks that are in the fleet maintenance world, fleet asset world are ex technicians or came from different avenues into it. Like, like we mentioned earlier, you fall into it. There's no college course for fleet management. It doesn't exist. Um, so if you can sit there and find other folks, it'll be, and everybody be, most people will be forthcoming with you. You know, you, they'll sit down. I mean, I, I love nothing more than mentoring folks or at least, you know, talking through Like, that's why I agreed to do this podcast. Cause if it's one person who hears it, that learns one little shred of information off of it, then that, that I enjoy that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of folks out there in the industry that are the same mindset. Yeah. And something else we spoke about that I think would be interesting too, is you never know what you might learn from someone, right? So whenever we were talking, you mentioned you've been running electric trucks. Uh, I think you said like 15 years ago or something. So yeah. talk a little bit too about, um, why, why you would encourage people to go ask these questions and kind of expand on that just a little bit more. Yeah. If you get uh, you got to ask the questions, especially if you've got senior leadership that will sit there and just say, well, we're going to do electric trucks. Okay. That's great. hundred percent on board, but why, <laughs> you know, you got to sit there and kind of ask the question, why that trucks four to cost four times more than our normal trucks can only haul half the, half the load. So we got to spend eight times more to be able to haul the same amount as what we've done before. You know, does that make sense? Why, you know, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to go down these roads? There is no silver bullet when it comes to these alternate fuels. Um, I think everything has its place. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying the different technologies, but I think everything has its place. Electrics are great for inner city. Low range, lots of stopping, lots of braking, so you get all that regen. And, um, you know, you can extend the battery life by doing that, doing inner city deliveries like a Boston, Bronx, you know, within New York, Chicago. Even Atlanta is kind of like a borderline city depending on where, where you run it, because Atlanta's kind of spread out. It's not as condensed as like, you know, a Bronx or a Boston or something like that. Um, you know, and if you really got to challenge the questions and if you don't know how to challenge it, then that's where you go reach out to the network and start getting some folks to, that have been doing it, that have been running. Look at the new, you know, look at the trade posts within LinkedIn or within the ATA and stuff like that and see who's, who's being promoted as being the top, you know, electric fleet. Well, find out who that person is, whether it's Bob or Sally or whoever, and reach out to them. And that's the great thing with like LinkedIn. You can send a message saying, hey, I'm looking for some answers. Can you help me out? You seem to be you know, top of your space or you go to these trade shows and they're up there on stage. You can go talk to them afterwards and find out, you know, find out what they're doing or how they did it or how they justified it, how they built the business case to justify it. And they'll tell you there was no one. We just, you know, we were told to do it or we did have one and this is how we did it. Yeah, and so, I think you touched on some great examples there of different use cases. You know, whenever I asked you which truck was your favorite or your thoughts on electric vehicles there, that each of them is so unique 
So could you kind of talk to what the intricacies and different challenges you see with all of these different use cases that someone in your position is having to manage and how you go about learning about all of these? Sure. Well, one, I mean, I've been learning about them for 15 years plus, um, having ran a, a host of different vehicles from electrics, natural gas, hybrid trucks. I mean, I, I operated the largest hybrid truck fleet in the country um, for many years. You, you, you've got to depend on the OEMs who build this equipment, which it goes back to that relationships we talked about before of working with the providers, suppliers, vendors. I call them partners because that's what they truly are, should be as a partner to you, not just a a supplier that supplies you something and then you don't hear from them again. You got to work with them to understand the technology and how the technology works. And I think you got to do a deep dive into that before you even cut a PO and to buy the equipment. You can't do that after the fact and then learn. <laughs> it's kind of what happened with the electric trucks that we had. We learned more after we bought the truck than we did before. Some of the stuff we would have never learned before, but you know, you really got to do your diligence with it first and really get to know it. And then, Again, reach out to those people that are being promoted as, hey, this fleet's the number one natural gas fleet in the country. What are they doing? Well, just reach out, find somebody. Again, you know, we talked about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon the other day when we chatted. In the fleet industry, it's the two degrees of separation. I mean, more than likely, you can find someone within talking to one other person. They'll connect you with someone who you can who you can speak to. And then we've kind of flirted around it, so I'm just going to take it head on. You've talked a lot about different um, alternative fuels. Talk a little bit about your experience with these and kind of what you see as the future with them as well. Yeah. So my experience, as I kind of mentioned a minute ago, is electrics, natural gas, LNG, CNG, natural gas, propane, hybrid trucks, um, the hybrid class sevens, which were basically just big Priuses. Um, they, you know, they had the electric support. I Again, I think there's a bought for every single one of them. I think there's, I mean, the hybrids, not so much. They pretty much stopped making those um, just because they were really, really expensive and they stopped making them. But natural gas, I think could be a great solution for over the road. Um, you're over the road. It'll get, you get the better gas mileage, quote unquote, gas mileage. Um, operating those trucks, it's cleaner. It's uh, easier on the motor. You don't have all the after treatment stuff on it. That's causing, that causes issues and costs more, puts more weight on the truck. The electric stuff, as I mentioned, inner city, you know, short, short route, short runs, this last, you know, the last minute mile delivery, all the stuff that Amazon's doing, UPS, FedEx, all your stuff that comes to your home or your business and delivery, that could definitely be within the, you know, the electric world. I mean, I've even seen where municipalities where school buses and uh, inner city buses are getting electrified now. They were not, they were one of the first ones to adopt natural gas. And now they're taking that step to go into the going to the electric electric world. But the, the electric part, you got to be careful of because you got to have an infrastructure to support that. I mean, all of you got to have an infrastructure to support them. But the electric's a little bit more challenging because you've got areas like New York, like California, that the power grid's already strained. And now you're talking about putting more on it. And I don't want to get into the whole political part about all that. But, you know, you got to pay attention to those types of things, especially when you're trying to put that in with your, your company. So like the one company I just, I was working for previously, their location in California was not part of whatever, say Con Ed or, or, you know, the power system for California. They were their own independent. Well, that little own independent couldn't do anything to offer up any benefits or even be able to change the grid to be able to do the electric. So that location right now is stuck to where they can't do electric, even if they wanted to. Even if they wanted to cough up the money to do it, it really can't because the grid can't support it. Mm-hmm. Their grid can't support it. So, you know, there's a lot of different challenging things you got to do. Like when we did natural gas at the beverage company, when we pulled those, we had to change our shops because they had to have the proper ventilation, the proper detectors in them. If we're going to pull that truck into the shop, you had to have those ventilation. You had to have the proper ventilation and the proper detectors in there um, just in case there was a gas leak. Um, You know, you got natural gas running, running. You don't want that (laughs) running around. Granted, it flashes real fast, but. You got you to take some special precautions. And the funny part about that was it really depended on the municipality when you were setting up those shops. We, one shop we spent $7,000 on, another shop we spent $100,000 on for doing almost the same work mm-hmm. or you know, retrofitting the shop the same way. It was just depending on what the fire marshal wanted to set up. So that's the other part you got to check with is like your local governance of 
you know, what do they, what do they require? What do they need for the, for that to sign off on you being able to operate that equipment? So what are some of the other big challenges if someone's considering implementing a big change, like um, adding one of these alternative fuels to their fleet that you would recommend kind of going through some type of checklist or what's kind of the best practice there? There's enough information published out there now that you could produce a checklist. Absolutely. And again, again, finding that mentor, finding someone who's been through it. Um, you know, not everybody has to be the first one to figure it out. The stuff's out there. The information's out there. I would, I would spend more time trying to find someone who's done it than trying to be that person who's the first one to do it. And that I don't think that's considered laziness. It's just more of the fact of trying to get it, get it done without hitting all the hiccups. Somebody's already paid for it in some way, shape or form. So why not, why not leverage their experience? Um, you know, the, the, the newer fleet managers that are coming into it, you've got to do your homework. I mean, that's the, that's the only way that it comes down to is you've got to do your homework and be able to follow up on that information. Again, I, I, the industry is friendly enough that you can do that. I don't think anybody's going to sit there and go, no, I'm not going to talk about it. There might be a few. I mean, don't get me wrong. There, there might be a few that don't want to talk about it just because that's, that's their own persona. But a fair, fair, fair number of them will sit down with you and say, hey, let's go grab a, you know, let's go grab a soda, go grab a beer, whatever your drink of choice is. And let's chat about it. And if they have a follow up, here's my card. Give me a call. Yeah. So we got into the into the weeds there, but I want to take a step back again and kind of zoom back out and think of it from that lens. Uh, we talked a little bit about what kind of advice you would give to your younger self, and I want to expand on that and open it up to what are some of the learnings that you've had over your career, and what are some of the takeaways that you think you would want to share. I think the biggest learning that I've learned in this career, see, the funny part was, is I stepped into, <laughs> I stepped into a role that didn't exist. I had to create it myself with the help of the VP that I was working for at the time for one of the largest companies in the country. <laughs> um, so I always said that I was the cutest girl at the prom <laughs> when I would go to these different events and things like that, because everybody wanted to talk to the beverage company. Um, I learned quickly after I left the beverage company that it was almost a social experiment of who really wanted to talk to you for you and who wanted to talk to you for who you worked for. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little humbling. And, you know, there, I have industry friends that are truly industry friends and then I have acquaintances and that's where the kind of, you draw the different lines. Again, most of them are friends, but there are still a few acquaintances out there. Um, you know, if I was to go back and tell myself back in 2008, Hey man, this is where it's going to end up in 2023, 20, you know, with the three different companies I've worked for and the different avenues I've gone, I would say, just stay humble, just stay humble, be humble enough to accept information and take information and, and also give it when you can. Um, those are the two, that those are the two biggest things. And that's why I've turned, I guess probably about five years ago, six years ago is where I turned the page and said, I want to start being more of a mentor than than anything else. I want to mentor other folks to get them into this, into this world, bring them into it. I mean, I've got three, three employees that I had recently that were like, we want to get to what you do. How do we do it? And I didn't have a good answer for them. That was the hard part. I didn't have a real good answer for them. Cause it's like, you stumble upon it. I'm like, I can show you how to do it, but I don't know if that will lead you down that road or not. It's, it's a, it's a little tricky. Well, I think that's awesome. You've kind of taken on that inspiration that you want to move into that mentor role and I want to talk about, you mentioned a lot of friends, industry relations all along the way, kind of talk through some times where someone helped you out and how, how you would kind of encourage the next generation, like you're doing yourself to be those mentors. How, how would you kind of share that information with them and encourage more people to do that? I will say that there are several people in this industry that saved my rear a couple of times. <laughs> Um, not so much in the, like something bad was happening. It wasn't, let's not, let's not construe it that way. It was more of, you sure you want to do that? You sure you want to go that way? And it was more on that partner side. It was more on that supplier partner side, the truck trailer manufacturer, that type of side where they, you know, they know that equipment. And, uh, you know, I really worked really hard with those guys to really understand the equipment as well. They're the ones who kind of covered, you know, covered <laughs> covered my behind when it came to that standing in front of the CEO of the beverage company, having to explain that type of, 
information, what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Um, and then when I got to the smaller companies, I kind of t- took on that same mentality. I'm still going to use my partners to help me, you know, help me make sure I'm saying the right stories, doing the right things. When you're in this type of role, you're pulled in so many different directions all day long because it's constant firefighting. It's it's never a sit back and relax and go, all right, everything's cool. There, there's never going to be it. There's never a day that everything's cool <laughs> because it's always changing. So you constantly got to keep working. You got to keep moving forward. You got to keep finding that continuous improvement, keep getting better, keep getting better. But you got to know at the end of it, there is no end. It doesn't stop. You just got to keep working on it. And then what have been the biggest changes you've seen in your career? (laughs) You know what? Not much. (laughs) You know, I mean, personally, yes, personally, I've had a lot of changes, but in the trucking industry there, even in the 16 years or so, it hasn't changed that much. Um, the technology has, you know, for sure the technology has, and some of that's positive, some of that's negative, um, you know, negative effect on the trucks, so on and so forth. But it's funny because we used to go to these shows all the time. We'd go every year and it's like, what, what are we seeing new? Nothing. What are we seeing new? Nothing. We're not seeing anything new. It's the same thing over and over again. Again, there's little things here and there. Like I did a solar project for when I lit, worked for the LiftGate company, worked on the solar projects and bringing solar to solar charging of lift gates. Why? Because lift gates biggest issue is batteries. So if you can figure out the biggest issue and find a solution for the biggest issue, then the other issues are nominal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just, it's those little things that make the improvements and the parts that I've always seen is everybody's looking for the hundred dollar change. Go look for the dime change, go look for the quarter change, go look for the, you know, or I shouldn't say change improvement. Let's, let's change it that way. Everybody's looking for a hundred dollar improvement. Not looking for the quarter change, nickel change, five dollar improvement, four dollar improvement. You know, those little ones will will mount up to bigger things later on down the road. But when you got everybody gunning for the big stuff, and especially in this type of role, you always feel like you got to justify your job a little bit <laughs> with with senior leaders. You always want to show something that's impressive. But I've always gone with the I'll show you a list of fifteen things that I did versus the one big thing. And then on top of that, I want to kind of see what you think looking forward to. What is your bold prediction for the future of trucking too? I think it's an open game right now. Um, you got autonomous trucks that is takes two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, one step back. Um, you know, they're making some good progress in some areas and then some in not. Um, but that's, that's, I think that's just new technology, right? I mean, that's just how technology works, but they're, they're trying to make it work. It's funny. I was just, uh, I was just worth a friend of mine for lunch today and we were talking about autonomous vehicles. I think that's, that's going to be huge, but I think they're going to run more like trains. You know, I think there'll be dedicated lanes, very, very specific lanes that those autonomous vehicles could run. Um, my particular theory on that is everywhere when you see in the cities, the, the, the H like an HOV lane, the pay, the pay express lanes. I think if you convert those pay express lanes to be autonomous truck only lanes, then you get the public out of the mix and you can isolate the public from those trucks and let them run for 45 minutes to an hour through town or whatever it might be. Um, I think the technology is going to keep moving forward. You know, you, there's another emissions improvement that has to happen here in the next year or two. Um, it's, it's crazy. Um, I think it's, it's the wild is, I think it's back to the wild, wild west again. I think there's a lot of things that are happening. The major OEMs are now knowing that they have to do it. The part that kills me. So I'll give you an example and I may be wrong on this. So they may come back and tell me this is completely inaccurate, but from what I thought I read was Cummins motors, who's been doing diesel motors for ever in a day is going to stop putting research into diesel motors and focus more on gas and alternate fuels. A little, that's a little troublesome when you hear that because I, I'm not 100. percent I'm not 100 percent built on the over the road. There's a solution for over the road, for that driver that goes from Atlanta, Georgia to Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Texas to LA, LA to Portland, Portland to Chicago, Chicago to you know it does bounces all over the country. Yeah, I think plenty of solutions for your ice, what I call contained fleets, the beverage companies, the food delivery, the Amazons, the UPS, FedEx. Those are all contained fleets. But that over the road stuff, I don't know if there's solutions quite yet. 
Um, but I think everybody's trying. But again, right now, everybody's trying and keeping it right here <laughs> instead of trying and trying to work with everybody as a whole. Yeah. So do you see that changing or do you think that's going to be the status quo for a while that everyone will be holding that close or is there kind of some hope that that will be opened up? I think I, there, I've got a bit of hope that it's going to open up. And I think it's more of the personality change within the fleet industry. For instance, you know, you still got some baby boomers. You still got some, the, the guys are, you know, back in my day when I could tune it with a, you know, I could tune it with a stethoscope and get it purr like a kitten. You got groups like myself who are kind of stuck in the middle, the Gen Xers. Then you got the millennials. I mean, I hate to go to this generation route, but it's the best way to describe it. You know, the Gen Xers are just like trying to make it through. <laughs> we're like, we're just trying to figure it out and make it happen. Where the millennials are really trying to push that, that technology envelope. And I mean that in a positive way. Um, really with using the data, using the information, and then also on that sharing side and sharing the information with the right folks. And I think if we can keep going down that sharing route and say, let's just try to make it for the betterment of the industry. But when it comes down to it, you know, that always comes down to this, right? It's going to come down to everybody wants to make the dollar. So that's, that's going to be, that's the, that's the hardest part. I think everybody would be willing to share it, but who's going to get paid? Well, awesome. Do you have any more closing thoughts you want to kind of tack on here at the end? Not really. I think I kind of spilled my guts on this one, but uh, <laughs> no, I've, I've been in this, like I said, I've been in this industry for 16 years. I love it. Um, I'm at a point right now. I'm not sure which direction I'm going to go with it. Um, just due to being, you know, looking for new, new opportunities. Um, if anybody's out there that has some opportunities for a fleet manager, season fleet manager, please let me know. But, um, no, I mean, I, I love this industry because there's so many different things to it, but also it's such a close knit industry that it's, it's hard to turn away. It really is. It really, really is. Well, awesome. Tony, thank you for taking the time and we appreciate your insights and look forward to having you back on soon. Absolutely, Jacob. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.